good morning everyone this is varsha from we bank education technologies mumbai we bring industry experts live into the classroom for today's session on data structures we have mr angad angad nagkarni joining us as our master speaker angad has been writing code since he was 10 he is a successful entrepreneur in the field of it he is the founder of examify a successful it startup Currently, uh, Angad is the co-founder of and CTO of Helloing. So, without any delay, I invite Mr. Angad Nathkarni to take over. A uh, quick update, Angad. We have S N College, Vizag Institute of Technology, J I E T Jodhpur, Pimpri Chinchwar College, P E S Modern College, K K V A, and D Y Patil College of Engineering. Okay. So Great. To you, Angad. Perfect. Thanks. Hi guys. So very quickly, just a small introduction on uh, about what I have been up to so far. I started programming very young in my life at around the age of twelve or thirteen, and I had started freelancing for security and technology consultancy by the time I was thirteen to fourteen, having made a lot of freelancing contracts along the way. I did a lot of zero dollar apps that i developed in my life up till the age of 18 or so where i first raised funding for my last company examify which we have subsequently exited examify was technology heavy from an ai and uh, machine learning perspective and i'm currently working on hello which is a voice messaging sdk product that um, is essentially a one line integration for mobiles as well as for the web uh, we are heavily invested into cloud and real time messaging and we also get to see a decent amount of data structures along our way there we recently partnered with google for our infrastructure and have begun scaling massively in terms of data at what we do at hello as well so i'm going to quickly get started with the content we have at hand for today which is to do with data structures my goal for the presentation today would be twofold one is to keep the content simple and light i don't want to go through a lot of code etc if any of you want to follow up on a particular structure or you know look at data structures in more depth i'm sure you can do that over the internet there's a lot of great resources available my role would be to give you an overview over the most commonly seen data structures uh, i won't be covering the more complicated data structures such as red black trees self balancing trees etc primarily because uh, most of them are plug and play libraries that you don't need to build yourself when you're out there building apps and uh, the second objective for my presentation today would be to hopefully show to you uh, practical implications of data structures and data modeling in general which is not something you are able to look at when you are at college at least by my personal experience right so let's get started so why structure data right um the most obvious reason that we need to structure data is because we need to retrieve data in a certain fashion typically this would involve querying data in a certain way typically this would involve computing certain metrics over data in a certain way uh, the most common reason that we structure data is also the most you know important reason behind why relational databases are the most popular form of storing data and that is the fact that they enable you to have a item and field like structure or rather a tabular structure and that's essentially why we structure data at the heart at the heart of all our arguments for structuring data the reality is we want to be equipped with a way to access data programmatically and express our querying or retrieval requirements in a natural fashion to our software um be it an sql database be it a no sql database at the end of the day structuring data is essential to retrieval of data and that's really why we have an entire science around how we organize data in memory while we're computing fast reads and fast writes um i choose to bring this up initially and early on because it will 
play a central role to something we look at later into this presentation about choosing the right data structures. But data is structured not just for retrieval, of course, flat files and linear retrieval is also always an option. But the reality is depending on the context and depending on the business requirement, you're either going to want to have incredibly fast writes. For example, if you're running a very heavy data entry operation, you want to have a data structure that doesn't take very long to have data inputted into it, as opposed to a massively consumed website, for example, which would want its data to be extremely fast to read, but it's okay with you know a few seconds of delay when data has to be inserted. So whether you're having a fast read or a fast write, um, and depending on just how seamless you want those operations to be in a day-to-day -day perspective, uh, your data structures start to vary. And lastly, of course, most data structures have been inspired by the world around us in terms of the natural behavior of how things occur, uh, be it a stack, be it a queue, be it a graph, a lot of those things come from natural concepts and we will touch upon that in a bit as well. But for now, it suffices to leave it to just this, that a lot of data structures are designed with a certain behavior of access in mind, with a certain behavior of prioritization in mind. And sometimes, just sometimes, our data structures are tuned for concurrency or multi-threaded access. This starts to become very important when you look at systems at scale, um, not just parallel computing, not just multi-core processing, not just multi-threaded, but also on the cloud today. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll touch upon that in this presentation as well, briefly. Right. So let's get started with the first and the most obvious data structure to start with. Stacks are naturally the first structure you want to look at for the simple reason that they're at the heart of so much of the computer that we see every single day. Last in first out um, is the natural behavior for a stack, right? A lot of textbooks, a lot of uh, theory that you will see on stacks refer to stacks as a pile of books on top of each other or a pile of magazines on top of each other. And the way stacks work is the element that is last inserted is also the element that is given when a pop is requested. So a stack is built from the bottom to the top and you keep heaping elements one at a time on top of each other. And every time an element is requested, the topmost element is returned by this data structure, right? Um, in terms of code, I'm pretty sure you can imagine how this looks like. Uh, the simplistic stack, of course, is a is an array and it simply has an integer counter to remember the last position at which an element was made available. So it just increments and decrements that counter, which is an index position in an array. And that is very simply gives you a stack, right? Um, of course, stacks are of two flavors, largely speaking, um, the fastest and obviously the most high performance stacks are the ones which come with predetermined storage or in the sense an array of a certain pre-allocated memory where you say, okay, I'm going to have a stack which grows no more than maybe say 400 elements or 500 elements, right? Um, that gives you the ability to place this stack as a primitive data type, um, as a struct inside a main memory stack itself as opposed to in the main memory heap right what what a main mem heap and a, what a what a main mem stack look like will be something we touch upon in a bit as well but the reality is when it comes to mallocs and you know freeze and when it comes to new operators in java when it comes to allocating memory dynamically all of that happens in the heap all of that happens with well nowadays you know randomly allocated pointers so it is very, very different from an efficiency perspective to have a stack implemented on an array versus to have a stack implemented um, with pointers. A static stack with a predetermined storage capacity is obviously much faster. Um, however, it comes with the obvious limitation of allocating too much or too little space beforehand, which is where 
the temptation to have a stack built with pointers comes into play. Um, this is where you essentially have one basic element called the stack item. And the stack item simply holds a pointer called next, right, to another stack item. And you just chain stack items and you simply remember the last inserted stack item and manipulate that pointer to give you a last in first out structure, right? Um, a lot of programmers choose to use a little bit of a hybrid between these two structures, uh, which is sort of like a, a linked list of arrays sort of data structure where you have a stack and the last element of the stack points into another array, which is also in this memory stack and not in the memory heap. And that starts to give you uh, the ability to jump, right? So it starts to allow you to section your stack into sets of arrays. And in the rare case, you want to give mid access at some point or in the rare case, you want to give some sort of, uh, you know, hybrid static property to the array. Uh, you can do that in a, in a hybrid linked list of array structure as well. This is perhaps the most fundamental use case for a stack, all procedural programming, all of assembly, most of your, all of your C or C plus plus, whatever programming languages you choose to use at the end of the day, get broken down into a memory stack. Um, functions dump their stacks. As you can see, um, there is a return link to the invocation that gets added onto the stack and the stack builds from top to bottom. Every time a function returns, the stack is popped and you keep returning to the stack block on top. Um, this is exactly how modern computers and modern processors actually compute. So perhaps the most fundamental use of a stack is in just to be able to write code on our computers. And of course, um, of late stacks are used to model user interface. They become a natural way to navigate through an application on the left here. You see composition of a very complex view on the iPhone on iOS, um, using a stack. These are elements which are superimposed one on top of each other. And they're allocated in a stack like last in first out fashion which means this view is the first to be deallocated, followed by this, followed by this, and then this one. And on the right, we see a data structure that maintains a navigation for an app. Um, typically when you swipe left or swipe light, or when you hit the back button or the forward button, you're essentially navigating through a stack of states. And that's exactly how most of your browsers, most of your app navigations come into play. Queues. Queues are, of course, far more inherently understandable um, than any other data structure you will see since, you know, given the nation we stay in, we are used to seeing a lot of queues uh, in our life on a day to day basis. Queues work very simply. The earlier you join a queue, the earlier you are let go. Um, you are typically looking at a first in first out. You have circular variants of queues where you have a static structure where you keep rotating uh, the start and stop positions for the queue. You have dynamic queues which grow in size and degrow in size. Um, obviously, uh, from an access perspective, static queues are far more efficient but face the same issue of uh, size and too much or too little memory given to them. You can all, always have variants built for queues as well depending on your need for storing data, but obviously at the heart of a queue is the fact that it is first in first out. Uh, queues in fact become incredibly handy for background processing and for scheduling of tasks. Um, queues are essentially the way cron jobs and memory management and you know, all sorts of background activity, um, they're scheduled with queues. Queues have this inherent property that sometimes it's great to have a central queue 
and have multiple points of access for them. It's just very tempting to do because, you know, a queue proves you, you know, proves to be a very resilient data structure in the center of a multi-access scheme. And typically on the cloud, AWS SQS is perhaps one of the most, you know, commercially successful products for a queue. Um, it works very simply. It gives you an API to create an object in a queue and to request objects from a queue. Uh, we've personally used this very heavily in the past for scheduling email, for scheduling uh, analytics, for scheduling cron jobs and stuff like that. Uh, a great question that comes to mind, of course, when you're using queues in, in the center of a multi-access scheme is... What about concurrency? What happens when you have two people pushing into a queue or two people popping from a queue? And uh, the simple answer to that is, of course, with things such as a semaphore. Uh, I would like to quickly brush upon a semaphore here for those of you who haven't looked at locks or how concurrency management happens very basically. But it is important to remember that on the cloud semaphores are nearly impossible to manage at scale, which is why AWS makes no guarantees for, you know, concurrency proof queue access. A semaphore works very simply. It, it gives you a single memory uh, location that you use as a counter to either wait or release upon a certain resource. Semaphores work by an you know, wrapping around a block of your logic that you want to protect from concurrent access. Right. Uh, in, in terms of behavior modeling data structures, trees are perhaps the nicest looking, funnest to program, you know, at least when you're in high school. And uh, they're great because they do a lot of sorting. They do a lot of problem solving that is logarithmic in nature uh, trees uh, especially binary trees uh, you know have this property that they can half a problem right so for instance here you see a sorted list where elements on the right of every node are larger than the elements on the left of it which are always smaller than the root element um, this gives you the ability to subset a sorted list with a further sorted list it gives you the ability to, uh, you know, it raises questions like what happens if I merge two of these sorted trees into one tree? And obviously the property of left and right being lesser and greater respectively come very handy in terms of efficiency when it comes to merging these structures. Um, yes, trees are a subset of directed graphs. Um, trees are typically one to many when it comes from a nodal perspective, whereas graphs are the parent data structure where you basically just have uh, nodes and you have directed connections between nodes. Trees aren't used so much more for social networks, etc. Primarily because of how powerful graphs are today with you know databases like Neo4j allowed. But trees still remain very useful in sorting, sometimes indexing, etc. Um, notice that typically when you're doing a merge sort or a quick sort, etc., a visualization would involve something which looks like a tree. How do you persist a tree, right? So a tree is great. It gives you efficiency. It lets you break down a problem into half. It lets you do a lot of interesting things, but how do you save it? How do you, how do you ensure that when you shut an app that's made a tree, uh, the tree is still available to that app when it loads up the next time. Um, of course, the first very simple way of doing it is you, you know, just store it in a flat file. You create some sort of a comma separated notation and you dump your entire tree into a text file and you load it. Obviously, that's a very, uh, it's like bringing a knife to a gun fight. And, um, in today, what you see commercial applications using is graph databases. So whether it is Facebook, whether it is Twitter, whether it is any of these popular social networks 
and as to how they let you do graph searches as to how they recommend friends to you as to how all of those parameters are analyzed graphs are at the center of all of those computations um, graphs enable you to do second degree third degree fourth degree querying which is very very expensive to do in a sql like database and uh, hence uh, you know the need to persist a tree uh, or a graph becomes very very important neo4j is perhaps it's it's beta software but it is still one of the more popular used um commercial databases that you see out in the world for graphing yes for most simple applications you would tend to not want to introduce another databasing technology into your stack so how do you persist trees how do you persist graphs in a sql like database um, i thought i'd touch upon one of these very interesting data structures that come across a year or two ago when i was working with cake php the rapid development framework for php and it's called the modified pre ordered traversal of a tree it's called the mptt and here is how an mptt looks like you have a simple tree except what i'm going to do is start numbering it in a wrap around fashion okay uh, it's i leave this as an exercise for you to figure out how you programmatically trust me it's not very complicated but this is how it works i start with the left of my root node i say 1 i go down i say 2 3 4 wrap around 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 right all the way back up to the root node and this gives me the property of being able to query subsets of this tree with expressive queries like if left is greater than 2 and right is less than 1 i'm essentially subsetting uh this half of my tree right so it's very useful for me to go ahead and make these queries upon this data structure with numbering yes um the one major pitfall for an mptt is it is highly inefficient to insert data into one so for example if i was inserting something underneath banana uh, maybe uh, you know small bananas and larger bananas um, you know you could essentially have to split and reorder the rest of the tree so then you would say 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 would be one node 11 12 would be another node and then 9 onwards would become 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 and 22 right so inserting nodes is an extremely expensive operation on mptts but it works great for high read low write sort of situations um access control lists right are data struct uh, you know are features that are always built on mptts so you know suppose you have a different hierarchy of staff that can access a certain file on the cloud so suppose you have an administrator you have a developer you have a junior developer senior developer right when it when you want to fine tune access to things with access control lists generally on an sql implementation you will find an mptt that is implementing it just because of how easy the api becomes to query and subset parts of this tree now graphs are and trees you know since they are subsets of directed graphs are naturally concurrent structures right uh, take for example search now a flat search would obviously go like this it would say okay um the search keyword starts with n so i'm going to go to the n section of my data structure notice that this illustration actually comes from what we often refer to as map reduce right uh, some of you might have heard of hadoop and friends and map reduce essentially works on the fact that i can reduce a problem to a certain node that can be processed in its own right by its own set of resources perhaps by its own computer by its own processor by its own thread whatever that whatever that resource may be right so graphs etc 
give you this inherent ability to subset a problem or delegate a problem to a certain resource. Um, the flip side to this is you can actually even do searches uh, within a node by delegating it across. So if all searches with N can be delegated to a certain set of resources, all searches with A can be delegated to a certain set of resources. So um, you can easily introduce concurrency into your program when you're inherently inherently your data is structured as a graph or a tree, right? Um, and this is at the center. This is the central theme behind uh, things like MapReduce, which are used at scale for all of your data and machine learning algorithms, right? Picking and designing the right data structure. So the most important question is first of all should you even write your own data structure uh, in my life i have never had to write my own data structure in the real world uh, engineering was fun and all of that but uh, in the real world you have open source libraries that do all of these things for you um, to be very frank with you uh, if there's one thing you can take off from this lecture it's that you should google uh, a lot of times you find the right data structures for you out there on GitHub or, you know, in a standard library. Uh, I would not, to the contrary of a lot of academicians, would not recommend you writing your own data structures. It's silly. It's stupid. It just becomes code that you have to manage on your own. Um, as long as you make an advised call as to what structure works for you, just pick the right library and move on. Uh, typically, yes, um, you will have to deal with certain inefficiencies, uh, especially if your library is heavy on generics or especially if your library is heavy on some, you know, something like reflection to make things worse. But more often than not, I found it more useful to not write my own data structure and to not reinvent the wheel. That said, how do you pick the right data structure? Very frankly, the first thing you have to understand is whether your use case for that data structure is read heavy or write heavy, right? Uh, you want to know whether you're going to be reading data more often than you're writing or vice versa. Um, and the second thing, of course, is just how much is scale important to you? I mean, are you going to be having a thousand hits a second? Are you going to be having 10,000 hits a second? How important is it for you to be atomic in your operations in the sense how often how often do you expect a writing operation to start but get interrupted midway by another operation right so things like that become extremely important when you want to pick the right framework to use in your application um, here's an example this is a simple hash map data structure uh, at the heart of a hash map uh, sorry this is an index my bad this is not a hash map this is an index and at the heart of an index is the ability to reference data in a secondary table. So here, for instance, you're seeing players, you know, with the name Ramel, R-A-M-E-L. And the way this reference is working is you can essentially query this second index table for Raymel and you will see that four, six and eight are linking to players whose name is Raymel, right? This could be a last name, for example. So, you know, if you wanted to query certain users by their last name an index could hold that reference um, and it would be much faster for you to reference it instead of querying sequentially on the main table. So things like that definitely, you know, increase your reading efficiency. But when it comes to writing efficiency, obviously you have to keep updating this index. And that means if you insert something in the middle, you're going to have to go ahead and update things after it as well. So um, you want to assess that very early on. Um, in a typical example, you know, if you have, if you have, say, a predominantly uh, homogeneous data set where everything is nearly going to fall into one or two buckets, an index obviously becomes very inefficient. So suppose you had all Shahs or all Patels 
and you know you're creating on major big index that you keep appending names to that's obviously not going to give you too much efficiency um because you're essentially just creating replicated data which which doesn't really enhance your reading time so um indexes are great for high reads and low writes and terrible for high write and low read situations um okay hashing and hash maps are um sort of the cooler indexes um the way they work is they rely on an algorithm to digest certain data and represent it numerically so you know in this case for instance you know you have things like fingerprints etc which you cannot represent as an image uh, in your database because it's just ridiculously inefficient so what you do is you extract certain features from this fingerprint and you represent them as hashes right that that sort of give you a data to represent that particular feature with and you store them in your database um in a more closer to home situation um you figure a way to map strings into certain integers in case of a collision you just keep appending that bucket with more and more values but the advantage of this is that at least you have now been able to subset your problem at least you've now been able to make it concurrency you know friendly in the sense that you can delegate a certain bucket to a certain set of resources for processing so uh, keys and mapping them into buckets are uh, at the ha- at the heart of hash maps and require what we call a hashing function which is how do i take a string and map it to an integer um this is a very trivial problem to solve at least in today's day and age most languages come with default hashing techniques for strings so i would recommend you look at your language manual before you reinvent the wheel uh, my personal language of preference of late has been apple swift and on swift strings are hashable uh, they implement a hashable protocol and um, they are actually very very easy to use for any subsequent data structures you build where hashing is important um thanks that's about it uh, i wanted to keep this session larger hopefully for q and a where i could take more pinpointed questions uh, feel free to reach out to me on twitter and facebook at these handles um and if there's any questions you have right now i'd be happy to take them as well Yes uh, so are there any questions from uh, the colleges which have joined in so as with all other sessions we will be using the chat box so uh, you can come near the screen and just ask me to unmute you Yes, yes, yes. So all the colleges are on unmute now. Just uh, spell out your name. Uh, start with your question. Any question from Wizag Institute of Technology? Wizag Institute of Technology is on mute. Unmute now.
Okay, do we have any question from D.Y. Patil College of Engineering? AK Wag Institute, do we have any question or are you using the chat box? Uh, Angad, we have got one question on the chat box from uh, PhD Engineering Coimbatore. Um, I can't see a question. I, I see an introduction. Uh, okay, okay. My name is Rajesh from PSG Engineering Tamil Nadu. Okay, Hi, Rajesh. Absolutely. So the question is, do we, do we still use queues and stacks in advanced programming? Um, Rajesh, we use stacks and queues um, at the core of uh, procedural programming. Uh, every function that you call inside a function, every recursive call that you do is essentially a stack in memory. So um, as regards advanced, I, I don't know how you would define advanced. Um, if you mean in terms of feature functionality if you're if you're asking um, as and when you start writing code that does complicated things on platforms uh, which are higher level do we use the core data structure of a stack or a queue to manage data yes um, especially at scale especially when you are servicing millions of users and millions of hits uh, queues come very very handy to schedule um, transactions to schedule data and cons and, and whatnot. In fact, that's exactly what we touched upon in the presentation. Uh, so to answer building our own stacks and queues, we may be using API built by others for us, but at the end of the day, yes, it is a stack and it is a queue that a lot of our code, even at the higher level is based on. So you may have to not worry so much about um, how to make a stack or queue yourself, but as regards which structure to pick for what use case, um, it's very, very handy to have a good understanding of which data structures serve what purpose and what tools you have in your tool belt. I hope I answered your question. Uh, any more questions from Rajesh or from his college? Rajesh, do we have any more questions from your college? Okay.
Angad, there is one question from uh, D.Y. Patil College from Abhay Awale. So my question uh, is, the, is regarding the word atomicity, how right data structure depends upon atomicity to you? Great. So um, I'm going to answer that question uh, uh, as simply as I can without getting into the depth of uh, an atomic transaction by itself. But uh, typically it goes something like this. If your data structure is requiring multiple layers of indexing, um, you will find this to be very common uh, if you're building a data structure from the ground up, right? Um, so if you're building a, a data structure which has multiple places go and build indexing information, validate or invalidate a cache, so on and so forth. Uh, you have to do a lot of rollback in those transactions fail, right? Uh, in most about this, in most SQL databases, you have atomicity guaranteed to you. But the moment you start doing a multi multiple layers of transactions for a single write or for a single read, that's when it starts to become very important uh, as to um, you know what happens if one of those transactions fails. Do I have an easy way, programmatically speaking, in my data structure to roll those things back? And at the same time, uh, what happens if multiple transactions were happening in persistence, you know, persisted memory? Uh, does a rollback of a last but one or a last but one more? Uh, affect the last but one in terms of time stamping and all of those things. So atomicity and uh, you know is of course not impossible to achieve, but reversibility and uh, in general the concurrent nature of a data structure that is exposed to network access at the end of the invocation call. Um, it's it's very important to understand. Uh, just how structure is to concurrency or to multiple people peeking into it. I hope I answered your question. We have uh, two or three more questions. Uh, the first one is um, please suggest algorithms to projects as we only study basic algos like big stars. Um, well, a Dijkstra is by no means a basic algorithm. Uh, I mean, yes, you end up studying it in engineering, uh, but I will be highly surprised if any of you end up using it in your life ever. Um, it's a it's an incredibly sophisticated graph algorithm, and um, it's not a simple algorithm. Um, I upfront disclaimer: I'm not an academician. I'm more of a product builder, so I would not be the right person to recommend which algorithm for you to look at um, especially in graphs for a project uh, but here's here's a thought um, it's almost never the data structure or algorithm that you pick it in any research work even if this is a PhD that you're talking about your study is going to be highly specialized and in case of data structures and algorithms your study is highly specialized to a certain subset of data of the universe a certain uh, corpus of documents, right? Um, it is all about optimizing your corpus of documents that you're analyzing. So I wouldn't worry about grounds up a funkier algorithm than Dijkstra or any of the other graph algorithms that we have. I would actually worry about optimizing them you know, hoping to God presses your um, professor in charge. Um, I hope I answered that question. Uh, if not, I'd be happy to take that one offline on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, my next question is, this is Ashish from PCCOE Pune. Hi, Ashish. Uh, my question is for a person who pursues career in this particular field, what are the particular basic programming languages required? Um, um, honestly, if you know C, uh, there's not a single programming language in the world that uh, you can't pick up because C is essentially just it's 
in the modern day it's modern day assembly if you really think about it you have to manage your own memory you have to manage pointers you have to pretty much jump jump around in ram is basic uh, necessary language if you if you want to build data structures or build you know very fundamental highly scalable highly reliable uh, and highly efficient uh, you know libraries um, yeah you have a lot of them implemented on python and php what not uh, with the exception of swift uh, all interpreted languages will start to choke when it comes to a few million hits and uh, that's when you start to rely on primitive languages like c uh, other than that um, there is no real um, you know language barrier the beauty of algorithms is that they can be expressed uh, in pseudo code as well and um, my 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 first question uh, back to you ashish and of course uh, we can take this offline as well is uh why do you want to per pursue a career in algorithms and research um it's an important question to ask uh it's it's not like building product it's not something that gives you immediate result it's going to take years of research and you're going to make an incremental dip. smart i'd be not go after a career in algorithms and research um you know i'm just being upfront with you uh especially when it comes to data structures these are relatively mature sciences um and you know it's fun and games when you're in college but if you're trying to build a career out of it um, that's a very very serious decision to take and that's something you should think through and perhaps get somebody more equipped than me in the academic field to help you and guide you in that aspect uh, the next question i have is pran Pranjali Jadhav from Matushri College of uh, Engineering, Nashik. Hi, Pranjali. Um, the question is uh, case study of Tim Sort as a hybrid stable sorting algorithm. What is Tim Sort? I have I've never heard of this before. Uh, can you elaborate? Okay, Pranjali, can you just uh, answer uh, Angad's question? I'm oh, one second, I'll, I'll, I'll just Google. Now. Right. So I'm looking at Tim Sort right now. It's a hybrid stable sorting algorithm arrived from merge and insertion. Um, it uses. Right. So. could you could you fine tune your question what what exactly is the question pranjali pranjali your college is on unmute now you can directly ask the question to angad are you able to hear me Is there any student representative or professor from uh, the college from Matoshri College, Nashik? Okay, um, I'm going to I'm going to answer this. Uh, I've read up on Tim Sort for all of thirty seconds, so uh, I hope to God I can add value to your previous understanding of Tim Sort. Um, the way it looks like to me is it's a lang it's a it's an algorithm that is. making a trade off between um you know the inefficiencies of a merge sort where it's obviously you know chopping up an array allocating more memory all of that stuff takes time uh, what it seems to be doing is using insertion sort for um you know sequences which are smaller than a predetermined number of elements so what tim sort does is it it does merge sort on the larger level and then after a certain size it will just do these min runs which it does in in insertion sort uh, because it's faster um so again right it's this is exactly what i mean i mean it's um without getting into the depth of what the algorithm does mota moti what the algorithm is doing is it's taking two algorithms and it's 
hyper optimizing them for a certain use case right so um, that's exactly what you will find in your study of data structures and algorithms um, in most real world cases it won't even make that much of a large difference to your sort uh, academically yes uh, it will, but um, you know greedy algorithms etc are only useful at an insanely insanely high level of efficiency um, I, i mean i mean greedy in the sense of picking between two hybrid implementations uh, at run time so you know again from a practical standpoint i've personally never had to use um, i've actually never known what sorting algorithm most of my applications use i use a standard library function so i've never really had to get down into understanding how the internal sorts work uh, but ranjali that said if you have any uh, pinpointed questions on tim sort i would be more than happy to study it for you and respond to you on facebook or twitter so chat so i hope that answers the question uh, is there any question more question coming in from the colleges angad there is one more question from uh, nasik devashish okay okay uh hi devashish um my question is which kind of programming procedural or oop is suited for data structure is actually a phenomenal question um i think uh, very hard to answer to be honest um and a lot of that a lot of it depends also on where this data structure is deployed so again uh, as with most great questions the answer depends very very heavily on the context of the problem so of course if the rest of your code base is object oriented if you're dealing with extremely well tied data entities if you're dealing with a highly mature oop platform uh oop is the only way to go but if hardcore efficiency or you want to be really close to how memory is being managed you want to really understand how the stack is being manipulated with every function call procedural is obviously the way to go because suddenly you don't have to worry about how garbage is being collected about how memory is being allocated when the heap heap is being used when the stack is being used you don't have to worry about those things so from a high efficiency perspective procedural would obviously give you that extra kick but uh i would never choose procedural i i would personally go with oop i would happily take the the few extra seconds it gives it adds to my uh, run time and primarily because devashish um the most important thing to do when you're doing data structures is to model data objects are great because they help us express the world around us programmatically in a way that is very simple to uh translate very simple to transfer on network you know it's 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 just very uh congruent to our perception so that's the reason i would model data always with objects i would not go the procedural way um but that said there are times when people choose to go procedural or choose to go uh, assembly even uh for that last mile optimization that you find in algorithms but if you have it my way just you know stick stick with the object oriented way of doing things i hope i answered your question okay do we have any more question that would be the last one okay that was all from uh, nasik from devashish any more question from the other colleges I think uh, that was all. I think there is no question from the colleges. Uh, okay. So students, uh, we've got a wonderful session from uh, Angad, and uh, today Angad was really busy. He had prior uh, commitments, but still he adjusted his schedule. uh please give a huge round of applause to uh
Angad, can we have a huge round of applause for Angad? All the colleges, please uh, wait for a few minutes. There are a couple of important announcements to be made. So this session was brought to you by SLEARN. And uh, here is a short video by Simply Learn on how the students can educate themselves and get themselves skilled. I'm John. I used to earn $70,000 a year ago, and today I make $110,000 a year all thanks to my data science certification. Let's talk about the data science certification and why you should consider a career in data science. You may wonder, what is data science all about? Data science isn't just a buzz, a trend, or a fad. It's a revolution that's changing the world with its tangible impact. It's the study of where information comes from, what it represents, and how it can be turned into a valuable resource when devising business and IT strategies. No wonder every organization considers data science as its biggest asset in today's competitive environment. It's one of the few fields that finds application across various industries, including finance, retail, healthcare, manufacturing, sports, and communication. Data science professionals are sought after at some of the biggest names in business, with the likes of Google, Facebook, and Amazon willing to pay hefty salaries to skilled, certified data scientists. This is precisely why Glassdoor has ranked it number one on the list of best jobs, and the demand for data scientists has never been greater. The U.S. alone will need 190,000 data scientists by 2018, and the average salary they earn is $120,000 a year. I've got there. You can too. All you need to do is equip yourself with a data science certification, and we've got just what you need. Here's what you get with Simply Learn's data science certification. 48 hours of live instructor-led online training sessions. 25 hours of e-learning. 40 hours of real-life industry project experience. Hands-on experience in predictive modeling with R, SAS, and Excel. An experience certificate in data science. So, are you ready to get the century's sexiest job? Sign up now. So this is the website of Simply Learn. That is simplylearn.com, and uh, in the section of courses, there are a list of courses from business to technology and different courses by vendors. And uh, when you go to technology courses, you have got uh, big data and uh, digital marketing and all these kind of courses. And uh, we have tied up with Simply Learn for uh, a flat thirty percent discount, so the students can visit. <laughs> And uh, enter the code as B530, that is W E B I N D 30, and get a 30% off. So the students can always visit uh, Simply Learn and use this code. And besides, there are certificates available for the students. Please do register yourself and get the free certificate. So that is all from our side. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience. Have a nice day.